So, where last we left you, you had gotten arrested for the mason jar mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. guns and all sorts of other things. Mm -hmm. By the way, I was right that it was a mason jar. I think it was like our our southern religious roots connected in the spirit world somehow. And as soon as Narcan Nate, although he's southern too, said Mountain Dew bottle, I was like, I'm thinking mason jar, man. And I was right. But so that all happened. You got arrested and you had a very spiritual experience in jail. And I think that's kind of where we left it. So how old were you when you went to jail? This is the period of time that I get so confused. I think I was 23. This is going to be between 2011 and 2014 is going to be the next block. So East Baton Rouge Parish Prison was, do you know the rapper Mystical? You ever heard of him? Yeah. yeah. And by the way, that just sounds scary. What you just yeah, said, dude. East Baton Rouge Parish Prison, yeah. that sounds like chain gang the worst that just sounds terrifying it's me. uh it's close it's rough but yeah the rapper mystical was in there that's uh, <laughs> well you so, were there? yeah so the so i was work. so eventually you know if you're once you've been there you know whatever you get the lay of the land when we heard mystical had gotten arrested like as a joke i was serving food i just asked every single person like doesn't matter what color they were i was like hey are you mystical and and then <laughs> then finally i was like hey are you mystical and he was like yeah and i was like oh shit <laughs> Here's an extra here's an extra portion, bro. <laughs> Dude, that's so crazy. Yeah. I feel like I've seen him on um he acts a little bit mm -hmm. too. I feel like that's how I've seen him in like movies and shit. Was he in there on like a drug um, charge? Uh, who, who, knows? Knows? who knows? Probably. Who knows? Um, right, yeah. But that dude, it was and I went in there. Oh God, I had to have been 130 pounds, maybe. Dude, um, dude. But I so I gained so much weight so quickly that I got hypertension for, <laughs> oh, oh yeah, no. I had having, I started having these weird like fainting spells and I was like, what's Dude, going on? They're well, like, oh yeah, you have hypertension. <laughs> in your twenties. Dude, they feed you crap. When, oh, one it's of the bread yeah, on top of so potatoes. Bad. Exactly. When I went to my last long-term program, it was very like kind of jail based and like the politics, we even kind of had politics in there. And the food was, we only got three times a day to go to the chow hall. You couldn't have food in your room. So it's not like we had a ton of food, but I got so big and I'm in fitness. Okay. And I was in fitness at that time. And I got ginormous. Like when I see pictures of myself and it's the same thing as jail and I would break out all along. Oh, my, yeah. It was just like the crappiest food ever. Oh dude, I got that. I can't understate uh how hellish it's like it's what so it's like i guess like so this this might sum it up so one of the popular things in there was something called dna and that is where you take chewed like already chewed tobacco spit that someone had thrown in the trash and you dry it in the microwave and then you roll it into cigarettes and sell those very popular oh my okay God. and the prison guards in the kitchen the one that was over the kitchen he knew that we do that so he would he would save up his spit dip all week and on fridays he would put it in a trash bag and he would throw it in the friday trash so it was kind of a race to see who could get to the dumpster first so one fucking friday I got there first and I, I had like a lookout man and I, it was just a flash moment of like, wow, this is your life. Like I was in the dumpster of East Baton Rouge Paris prison in the summer, digging through the prison dumpster, trying to find a trash bag full of chewed tobacco that I could smuggle back. And I found it dude. <laughs> and uh, I wrapped it up in saran wrap and like squished it like a pancake and I put it under my shoe and we, I was wearing tube socks, like, like knee high socks. So you have to strip down naked when you go into the kitchen and we leave the kitchen. And I was cool with the guard that stripped us down and he was like, pay and drop them. And I was just like, Oh, I was like, no. And he was like, man, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so I guess it had leaked because when I got to the dorm, my sock was completely soaked yeah! brown from where it had just oh like, my God. Dude, disgusting. But bro, I made so much money off of that. It was awesome. That was like the best. 
<laughs> that's so that place that definitely sucks. sums it up so do you guys have because in california there's real strict politics and there's like you would be a wood here are there woods out were you like a wood or there as somebody put it your own brother will stab you okay. like nobody there's no cared. politics or it was anything. there was there not really okay. so the first dorm i was in i lived in what they called the trailer park because it was just three white, white guys. guys, me and two other white guys. <laughs> yep. And so we, our little bunk, they the just called that the trailer park, park which I thought That's was funny. hilarious. No, but otherwise there, okay, there was none okay. of that. But it was like, so because of that, it was kind of like a free okay. for all. Because this was the place where, like, there's a few people, may, I think the max time people were doing here was like five years or something. It was most people like coming through. Have you ever heard of okay. Angola State Prison? Yes. Okay. Yes. So. But we would get people coming from Angola going somewhere else. So, yeah, there was oh. like a, you know, 15 year Angola dudes coming through. And it's like it was it was very frightening. The yeah. the worst violence I saw, though, was the guards on inmates. And they would just absolutely like beat the shit out of people wow. like wow. mace us down all the time. So I do get his face smashed in with a walkie talkie. Like Dude, jail to me is terrifying. Like occasionally I'll, I'll interview people and they're, or, or, you know, hear somebody like on another one. And often people will be like, Oh no, I wasn't scared, whatever. And I'm like, uh, I was, I was really scared to go to jail. I was terrified to go to jail. I thought I was going to get beat up. And I'm sure I, it would be scarier for men. I think that's one of the only places in the world where I think it's scarier for men than women. But as like a young man going into jail, I would be fucking terrified. Like oh, and dude. Been. Oh, well. And so you get like a certain amount of pity leeway because, dude, I so when I got arrested, I was on 32 milligrams of Suboxone, like 12 milligrams of Valium, like so oh, no. much antidepressants. And so that was just cold turkey. And oh, no. dude, I I su suffered for, you know, a week and a half. So nobody really messes with you there when you're kind of doing that. It was kind of pointless. Yeah. But then after that, yes, the it's, uh, game, on. it's game on. And yeah. luckily, I only had to like check someone like twice. Um, I didn't really right. get you can kind of stay out of it for the most part. But I, yeah, but there was there was definitely like sexual violence. There was regular violence. Uh, that That's was that I'm was saying. a it was a weird threat where it was like, yo, dude, I'll, you know, I will. Yeah, it's That's, fucking weird, bro. Yeah, it's so terrifying. And as a man going into that situation, it's just I can't even imagine how scared I would be. That was my experience too in jail. While I was detoxing, I really got left alone. Mm -hmm. And fortunately for me, because I broke all the rules the first time I went to jail, you know, there's all those fucking rules. Oh yes, yeah, and I didn't, I didn't know any of them. So like, I didn't even take a shower for a few days because I was sick. Yeah, that's a bad one. Did you, I took my, huh? Did you uh, I, borrow? What does that mean? Oh, like did you like get food like on loan from anybody? That's where I fucked up. Well, because I, but I would have fucked up doing, I would have, I fortunately was always able to bail out. I never mm. stayed in real jail longer than like four days. Yeah. So I was detoxing the whole time, but like, and I've told the story in the podcast before, but like I took my nightgown off cause I was like sweating and a lady came over and like sat on my bed and gave me all the rules and was like, you cannot get naked over here. There's girlfriends in here, put your fucking clothes back on. Have you taken a shower? I pulled my mattress from one side of the dorm to the other. Cause somebody was snoring oh. and she was like, and she was like, you don't move your bunks. This is your fucking house. You live here. Like all these rules. Yeah, and man. then thank God I left. Cause like once I started cleaning up, if I was still in jail, like I just know I would have gotten in so much trouble because I would have gotten involved in dumb stuff. I didn't know better to stay out. I didn't you know either. What I, mean? I, did, I didn't. I learned the hard way a lot. Oh my uh, God. Yeah, I, I do. Cause I was, once the detox ended, then I haven't eaten in a year, you know? So like <laughs> I was. That was the first time I've like really, I think, experienced like hunger where like, dude, I was I was dreaming about it and I was so, so hungry and two for one. So that was the thing. It was like, hey, I'll give you a honey bun today and you give me two when you get your commissary. And dude, I did that to like everybody in my dorm and then my commissary didn't come through. Oh, no. Uh oh, dude. Yeah. So that was that was actually the first 
this is actually the first spiritual experience. So my, my commissary didn't come through and I had one, well, I had a few, but I had one really close dude and he was like, yo man, I can't fuck with you anymore. He's like that, you know, like tonight, they're probably just going to take you in, in the day room and just handle you and i was like what <laughs> he was like yeah man i mean oh you fucking. i was gosh. like oh my god oh, no so oh, no. so i'm sitting in my bunk at like 8 8 30 like i was dude i was stressed out and at nine o'clock i just hear pain pack your shit and i was like what because i forgot that i had i think like right when i got there i had applied for a trustee job and that night is when they pulled me out to go to the trustee dorm. It was like, uh... That, that's an actual spiritual experience. Oh, my God, I think dude. I got really lucky out there in terms of violence, right? And I came out relatively unscathed. And I think that there was some... I feel like God knows what we can handle. And if I had had something physically violent happen to me, maybe I never would have gotten sober. That might have taken me over the edge because I was right there anyways and be like, this is my life now. This is who I am. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. I don't know. Because I do think that there's some protection there. But then it, oh, gets, for sure. then it gets a little controversial though because it's like, what about people that did get hurt? Yeah, do, and I did. You know what I, mean? I, I did, I guess those, so I had already had, no, it necessarily at the time, but I'd gotten PTSD from two instances. So when I was... 18, 19, I had gotten, I told this, I don't know, I told the story recently, I think, but I had gotten maced and the shit kicked out of me by a crackhead and he robbed me that way because I was an idiot. I mean, he beat the shit out of me and maced me and stole all my stuff. And so that was one. And then the second time, I think it was somehow drug related. This was like shortly, this was actually right before I got well, this was like shortly before I got arrested, I think. Uh, it was like, it was when things were really getting bad. I was delivering pizzas for Hungry Howie's on LSU's campus and, you know, whatever. I was, you know, high as shit. And I was dealing, delivering pizzas is a perfect cover for dealing drugs, by the way, because sure. you're, yeah. you know, <laughs> hey, uh, it was awesome. So I went to this apartment. Uh, there were no, it was an apartment complex in the middle of, you know, not a sketchy area. And like the lights are off in this corner. And I was like, whatever, I'm high. I am not situationally aware. And I pull up and I get out. And then all, so I was wearing a hat. And all of a sudden, my from behind me, my hat gets pulled down over my face and a, a dude sticks a gun in my back. And he's like, give me all your shit. And I was like, okay, like, and then two other people swoop in from the sides. And I was like, all right, you got me, you motherfucker. And I thought that was going to be it. And then I was like, so we cool. And he's like, nah, man, I got something for your ass. And I was like, what? And so they dragged me behind a dumpster and had me lay face down. And I was that it, all of a sudden it was like, Oh, I'm going to die. Like I'm going to die. They're going to shoot me in the back of the head. And he had like put the gun at the back of my head. And then the next thing I know, he just, he just pistol whipped me in the temple and they, they ran off and dude, I just like laid there. It just like, what oh yeah it was gosh. terrible <gasps> i can't believe that happened i'm so sorry that that happened that's so that's terrifying yeah i started <laughs> delivering pizzas with a gun on top of the box like in the bag yeah, like dude it's, it messed me up i guess still i mean i still have the hyper vigilance and stuff and then other times in baton rouge i've been shot at from drug deals gone wrong and just a lot of that stuff happened in short succession. So like I was, yeah. I was already like, yeah, wired. <laughs> not good. So, man. so, and we're kind of jumping ahead of the story a little bit, but with PTSD, when did you realize that you had PTSD? Like, were you officially diagnosed or did you just learn about it? And then how do you deal with that now? I was officially diagnosed now. Like the only real holdovers. Well, I have different. I have like needle PTSD from a particular night where three meth heads tried to hit my arm in a bathroom for hours, 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 hours. I remember it. So, and it was just over and over and over and over. And just like, everyone's just all, we're all just tweaked out. And it's, dude, you, it was, you were letting them. It was voluntary. But yeah. They were just missing. Yeah. Oh okay. yeah. Just awful. Lots of terrible medical experiences of overdose. Like I've had six hospitalized overdoses 
And a lot of them, especially in Florida, they treated me so subhumanly and were not. Yeah, it was bad. Just a lot of a lot of things like that. So I have the like nobody behind me in public sitting, you know, back to it. Always the first thought when I meet someone is like, if I have to fight them, like, what's the plan? Where am I going to hit them first? What are they going to do? crowds it's it's just all the constant constant vigilance and then i'm jumpy it's like i get a full nervous system electric shock like at any like loud noise and stuff okay yeah okay but it's you know I, a- i've just learned to deal with it yeah i mean is that part of the tr- i i don't even know if you would call it treatment just like awareness that this is the thing that i deal yeah. with but i know yeah. that this is where it's coming from so like okay i started brain spotting recently and hopefully i'm going to be doing emdr which is some new what is brain spotting? brain spotting is i don't even quite fully understand it but it would be like so the therapist would like put a a colored ball on the end of a long stick and they're kind of moving it in front of your line of sight and whenever you feel something you're supposed to tell them to stop and then you focus on that spot and so and then you kind of it that's where it's you either you can like talk freely what you're going through you see things or it's one of those things that sounds like com- i thought it was like complete bullshit but it was like The last time they did it, when I just got to a certain spot, I just started crying. It was the weirdest thing. So I've done EMDR and I know that that works. And it makes sense to me that the tracking works because there are those neurological pathways, the neural pathways in our brains, and they're looped in a certain way, but they can be undone. And I know that you can undo it with vision tracking, obviously, because that's what the EMDR is too. I put on headphones like these and I held two things in my hands and they clicked back and forth. And when your eyes are closed, I guess your eyes are going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I would tell a story that had affected me as I did it. Oh, I I want to try that. It's supposed to be really, really, really helpful. I did it for a while and I, I do think it was helpful. I think I need to do it again. What I was working on is something that's probably going to take like my whole life to get over. But my husband has also had a lot of trauma like that, violence and PTSD and EMDR worked really well for him. He was able to do it in a treatment center and it was one of the most successful things I think in his life and recovery was doing EMDR. So I'm excited for you to try it. I, I, that I know is very successful. Ironically enough too, jail helped a lot because a lot of my PTSD was focused with, it was always acts of violence by like a particular like archetype type thing and me being and cops too and so it was like exposure therapy type thing and it really like helped a lot in the in the weirdest way yeah yeah that makes sense Mm -hmm. well it takes like the mystery out yes exactly and and you know there's like the fear of the unknown and then once you're actually in that situation like you said exposure therapy so 